Well, hello, all my lovely souls and all my single and whole gentlemen and gentle ladies. Welcome to another episode of the Get Married Whole podcast. Embrace wholeness in love and life. I'm your host, Queen Rakelia, and today we're diving into chapter four of Dr. Miles Monroe's Kingdom Principles, Kingdom Concept Number One. Understanding the Kingdom Concept of Kings. This chapter was so full of incredible insights about kingship and authority, and I can't wait to share them with you. Let us open today's episode with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the wisdom to understand your kingdom and our role as your children. Open our hearts and minds to receive the principles of kingship and governance as we continue our journey toward living as kingdom citizens. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter four, kingdom concept number one, understanding the kingdom concept of kings. In recent times, it has been a popular notion to celebrate the opposition against monarchies, and many have even suggested the eradication of the concept of monarchies from our so-called modern or postmodern world. Popular uprisings against the remaining monarchies in the name of the pursuit of democracy have become the craze of today's self-proclaimed freedom fighters. In some cases, it may be justifiable in many of the instances cited, these kingdoms are filled with contradiction, abuse, oppression, social extremes, and dictatorial administrations. However, it must also be noted that many of the democracies in our world today are also plagued with the same defects and shortcomings. In essence, the problem is not the king, the kingdoms, or even the form of government, but the defects in the human nature that functions in any of these systems. Yet, the kingdom concept is the only one presented, preached, promoted, taught, and established by Jesus Christ throughout his ministry. His proposed solution to mankind's problems on the earth is the establishment of the kingdom of heaven and the earth. As a matter of fact, the message of the Bible and more specifically, the focus of Jesus was not a religion or for that matter, any of the many subjects we have magnified and many have preached as the gospel or good news to the world. For instance, Jesus never preached as a priority public message subjects like faith, prosperity, giving, deliverance, or even his death on the cross or resurrection as the gospel. But he repeatedly promoted and declared the kingdom of God and heaven as his principal message. I am well aware that what I just said may be cause for much reaction, mental conflict, and religious resistance, but I would encourage you to search and research the four gospels for yourself and discover this surprising reality. Jesus also indicated that this message of the kingdom would be his disciples' message to their world. Jesus' message of the kingdom was foreshadowed in the Old Testament centuries before he was born in Bethlehem. Here are two examples. The first one indicates God's motivation for delivering the slave clans of Israel from Egyptian oppression. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Exodus 19 and 5 through 6. In the second example, we see the Old Testament Masonic promise declared by the prophet Isaiah strongly indicating the governmental aspects of the kingdom mandate. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. 
and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah 9 and 6 through 7. Jesus' message was clearly kingdom focused and not religiously motivated. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 4, 17. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Matthew 4 and 23. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Matthew 5 and 3 through 4. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 20. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 9b through 10. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 33. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Matthew 9, 35. As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 10, 7. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Matthew 12, 28. He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Matthew 13, 11. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Matthew 13 and 19a. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Matthew 13, 24. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Matthew 13, 31. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Matthew 13, 33. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and brought that field. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Matthew 13, 45 through 46. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kind of fish. Matthew 13, 47. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, 19. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his own kingdom. Matthew 16 and 28. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, 34. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Matthew 18, 23. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. Matthew 20, and one. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, 
The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Matthew 21 and 31b. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Matthew 22 and 2 through 3. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of the heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Matthew 23 and 13. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Matthew 24 and 14. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Matthew 25 and 34. After this, Jesus traveled about from the town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Luke 8 and 1. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Luke and 9 and 2. Then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethesda. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Luke 9 and 10 B through 11. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Luke 9 and 27. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Luke 12 and 32. And I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me. Luke 22 and 29. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. John 18 and 36. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me, John 18 and 37. My purpose for listing all of these statements is to show and emphasize the preoccupation Jesus had with the kingdom concept rather than a religion. Note, in particular, the last statement above where Jesus declares himself a king and not a president or prime minister or mayor. This is why it is necessary and essential that we rediscover and desire to understand the kingdom as a concept and a reality. It is the foundation of God's plan for mankind. The original idea kingdom concept is distinct from the earthly version, even though it contains many of the same components and concepts of all kingdoms. Despite the many failed kingdoms throughout history, the questions still arise. Why did God choose a kingdom and not a republic? Why did God choose a kingdom and not a democracy or socialism? What are the benefits of being in a kingdom over a democratic republic or communistic reign? Why is a kingdom better than a democracy or socialist form of government? Why is Jesus a king and not a president? What exactly is a kingdom? Very simply, a kingdom is the government of a king. More specifically, a kingdom is the sovereign rulership and governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his intent, his purpose, manifesting a culture and society, reflecting the king's nature, values, and morals. A kingdom is the governing impact of a king's will over a territory or domain, his influence over a people, and a government led by a king. Therefore, the very heart of any kingdom is its king. This definition perfectly describes the relationship of God to the heavenly realm. 
Heaven exists because of the creative activity of God. Throughout its entire expanse, it is infused with his presence, character, and authority. There is no corner of heaven where his will is not accomplished. In every way, God is the unrivaled and unequaled king of heaven. The same was true in the natural realm when God extended his kingdom authority to the earth through the man and woman he created in his image and released to rule in his name. They rebelled against the king's authority, however, and lost their rulership. Control of the earthly realm then passed temporarily to a demonic usurper until the day in the king's sovereign plan when it would be restored to its rightful ruler. In the fullness of time, Jesus came to earth and reestablished the kingdom because only a king can establish a kingdom. This act alone reveals that Jesus Christ is the king. The Bible, the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, leaves no doubt as to the kingship of Jesus. Perhaps the clearest statement of all is found in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus, mere hours before his execution by crucifixion, has a revealing exchange with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the province of Judea. Falsely arrested, illegally tried, and wrongfully condemned for blasphemy by the Jewish religious authorities in Jerusalem, Jesus now stands before Pilate for judgment. Pilate has heard the accusations that Jesus claims to be a king. So the governor asks him directly, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. John 18, 33 and B, 36 through 38 A. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world and my kingdom is from another place, clearly implying that he was a king. He was speaking of the kingdom of heaven. Notice that Jesus said that his kingdom was not of or from this world. He never said that it was not in this world. His kingdom on earth originated in heaven. When Pilate pressed further, Jesus plainly said, I am a king. He then said, I came into the world to testify to the truth. What truth? The truth that he was a king with a kingdom. What could be clearer than that? Testify is a word often used to describe what a witness does in a courtroom. Testifying or abawing to what he has seen or heard. The original Greek word employed here has a even deeper meaning. It is a word of experimentation from the laboratory and means to verify or validate. Essentially, Jesus said to Pilate, I came to earth because I am a king and I will prove it by putting it to the test. I testify to the truth that a king is here, a kingdom is here, and this kingdom is available to anyone who wants to come in. The last thing Jesus said to Pilate was, everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. A more accurate rendering would be everyone on the side of truth hears me. This is a very important point because it has to do with connecting to Jesus' message. Everywhere I go teaching the message of the kingdom, I find that it resonates with people from all religions and walks of life. God created us for kingship, for dominion, and inside each of us is a Latin kingdom consciousness striving for expression. 
This consciousness reveals itself in various ways, such as in our natural resistance to being ruled or controlled by any other person and our continual longing to control the circumstances of our own lives. That is what finally connected me to Jesus. When I realized that he could teach me how to run life, not let life run me, I learned that I could control my own circumstances. The search for power is a natural human drive. We all seek power over things and over circumstances, and that is what the kingdom of heaven promises. Jesus said, I will testify to the truth of the kingdom, and when you hear me, you will believe it. You will connect with what I have to say because it will resonate with the kingdom consciousness that is already in you. We connect with the kingdom message because it addresses the most deep-seated longing of our heart, our longing to be kings. While it is natural to desire power over things and circumstances, desiring power over people is another matter. Seeking to influence people, public, opinion and public policy through kingdom principles is always appropriate but pursuing despotic power over other people for personal gain at their expense is a corruption of our natural quest for power desiring to control our own life is one thing desiring to control others lives in another the king is central to his kingdom if we were created for kingship and if Jesus came to earth to restore that kingship we lost, and if we want to be prepared to resume our rightful place as kings, then we had better learn what it means to be a king and how a king relates to his kingdom. This is important both for teaching us how to think, speak, and behave like rulers and for teaching us how to relate properly to God, our high king. A true king is not a dictator. The first thing we need to understand is that a king is the central component of his kingdom. A king embodies the essence of his kingdom. The kingdom is the king. Without the king, there is no kingdom. The land and the people may still be there, but unless they are ruled by a king, they are not in a kingdom. This is one primary distinction between a kingdom and a democratic state. In a democracy, the country's leader, whether called a president or a prime minister or whatever, is not the center of the government. The constitution is. Presidents and prime ministers change every few years, but the Constitution provides continuity of law and government. In a kingdom, the king is the Constitution. His word is the law. His word is the government. Second, a king is the ultimate and only source of authority in his kingdom. In the kingdom of heaven, the authority of God, the king, is exclusive and absolute. His word is law and his will is carried out even to the farthest reaches of his realm. And God's realm is infinite. The sole and absolute authority of the king is what distinguishes the kingdom of heaven from religion. Religious people give up lip service to God's kingship, but then turn around and debate questions and even amend his laws. For example, the king says that homosexual behavior is an abomination. See Leviticus 18.22. Yet a gathering of bishops who supposedly honor the king's law install an openly and actively homosexual priest as an archbishop. In the kingdom, the king's word is law. It is not open to debate, discussion, challenge, or amendment. While this may seem restrictive or even despotic to someone raised in a democratic environment, in many ways it actually relieves a lot of pressure. If you are under the king and someone asks you, what do you think about so and so? You can defer to the king's authority. What I think does not matter. I am bound to follow my king and my king says this, or I agree with my king 
And this is what he says. In a democracy, political leaders campaign, negotiate, compromise, and consult committees in an effort to reach a consensus for establishing law and policy. In the kingdom, the king speaks, and that's it. No debate or question. The authority of the king is like the slogan that began circulating years ago. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Even better is the variation. God said it, and that settles it, whether I believe it or not. Jesus demonstrates this kingly authority when he said numerous times, you have heard, but I tell you, see Matthew 5 and 21 through 22 and 27 through 28, 33 through 34, 38 through 39, and 43 through 44, emphasis added. The biblical account of this occasion records, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teacher of the law. Matthew 7, 28 through 29. Emphasis added. Jesus spoke and taught on his own authority. He did not rely on thoughts, ideas, interpretations, or traditions of others. Why? Because he was a king whose authority was independent and sovereign. This leads to a third point to understand about a king. The sovereignty of a king is inherited in his royal authority. The people do not make a king sovereign. He is born sovereign. Jesus told Pilate that he was born a king. He did not receive his kingship or his sovereignty from the hand of men. Sovereignty means freedom from external control. As sovereign, a king is free to do as he pleases with no accountability to anyone else in the kingdom. Otherwise, a king has no true authority. No one has the authority to tell God what to do. God's sovereignty is absolute. He is completely self-determining. 14 Characteristics of a King a king is distinct both from a democratically elected leader, such as a president or prime minister, as well as from a dictator in, to in a totalitarian state. Following are 14 characteristics of a king that clarify that distinction. Number one, a king is never voted into power. His power is inherited from birth. Democratic leaders are elected to power. Totalitarian dictators seize power, but a king is born into power. Number two, a king is king by birthright. His kingship is not conferred by men. Elected leaders rule by the will of the people. Dictators rule through fear, repression, and coercion. A king rules because he is born to it. Jesus Christ was born a king. We do not make him king. All we can do is acknowledge that he is king. Number three, a king cannot be voted out of power. Because the kingdom is his by birth, a king rules for life. A president is voted out of office or departs due to term limits. A dictator may be brought down by a cuptitate or popular uprising. Kingship, however, is a lifelong office. A human king may be dethroned by force or revolution, but he can never be voted out. The king of heaven reigns by sovereign right of creation. He will never be voted out of power, nor will he ever be dethroned. Lucifer tried and failed. Human empires have tried and failed and then fallen themselves as in the destiny of all reigns that challenge his sovereignty. He was king before his world began and he will still be king after it passes away. In fact, scripture makes this bold declaration. 
The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Revelation 11, 15b. No act either of man on earth of the spiritual powers of darkness will ever remove the king of heaven from his throne. Number four, a king's authority is absolute. That is why he is not a president or a prime minister. Presidents must consult Congress and prime ministers paramount. If the prime minister of the Bahamas makes a decision, the Senate can discuss it. The paramount may attack it. The media may mutilate it and he may change his mind. Dictators, on the other hand, while perhaps exercising absolute power for a time, possesses no legitimate authority. This is why they must use force and repression to stay in power. But when a king speaks, he speaks with absolute authority, authority that is inherited to his kingship. Number five, a king's word is law. Because a king's authority is absolute, his word is law. No one can countermand his orders, negate his pronouncements, set aside his decrees, or amend his statutes. David, an Israelite king who loved the king of heaven with all his heart, had this to say about this king's law. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Psalm 19 and 7 through 9 and 11. The king's word is law. Great reward follows obedience. Disobedience brings severe penalties. Number six, a king personally owns everything in his domain. Presidents and other elected leaders do not own their countries. They are citizens like everyone else. Dictators often act as though they own everything, but whatever they possess, they acquire by fraud, theft, and corruption. A king, on the other hand, personally owns everything in his domain. In fact, a kingdom is the only form of government where the ruler owns everything and everyone. In the words of King David once again, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who lives in it, Psalms 24 and 1. The king of heaven himself declares, every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills, Psalm 50 and 10. A king owns the people, the animals, the planets, the land and the air around the land. He owns the value under the earth, the gold, the silver, the platinum, the diamonds, etc. He owns the soil and the seeds in the soil. A king owns everything in his territory. That is why he is called a lord. Lord means owner. We'll discuss more on this concept in the next chapter. Number seven, a king's decree is unchanging. In a democratic system, laws can be amended, revised, or revoked. Dictators change and even reverse their own decrees whenever it suits them. They renege on their word all the time, but a king's word is law. Once a king issues a decree, it cannot be changed. Daniel, a faithful God-fearing Jew in exile, was a high official in the court of Darius, a meadow Parisian king. When Daniel's enemies plotted to destroy him, they persuaded Darius to issue a decree that for 30 days, no prayers or petitions were to be raised to any God or anyone else except to the king himself. Violators would be thrown into a den of lions. This decree was a law of the Medes and Parisians, which may not be revoked. Daniel 6 and 8b, NASB. 
catching Daniel in the act of praying to God in violation of the king's decree, as they knew they would, Daniel's enemies took him to the king. Darius was trapped. Even he could not revoke his own decree. The king spent a tormented, sleepless night while his trusted servant Daniel cooled his feet in the lion's den. The Lord delivered Daniel safely and his enemies ended up with the lions instead. The point here is that a king's decree once issued cannot be undone. The decrees of the king of heaven are just as permanent. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40 and 8. Jesus the king said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Matthew 24 and 35. Number eight, a king chooses who will be a citizen. In a democracy, the citizens choose their leaders while a totalitarian system treats its citizens as little more than tools of the state. A kingdom operates in the opposite manner. The king chooses the citizens because his authority is absolute. He determines the standards of citizenship in his kingdom. The people do not vote for the king, but in essence, he votes for them. Jesus demonstrated this kingly prerogative as well when he said to his closest followers, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each another. If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. John 15 and 16 through 19. Jesus chose them out of citizenship in the world and made them citizens of his kingdom with full benefits of citizenship. They no longer belonged to the kingdom of the world. Now, like Jesus, their kingdom was from another place. Jesus does the same thing today for everyone who believes in him, everyone who accepts his message of the kingdom. Number nine, a king embodies the government of his kingdom. This means that wherever a king is, his entire government is present. Whenever a king speaks, his whole government is speaking. Whenever a king moves, the government moves with him because he embodies the government. The king is the government. When President Bush travels abroad, the authority of the United States government travels with him because he represents the government and the people. The government itself, however, does not travel with him. It remains in place and functioning in Washington. The government of a king, on the other hand, is wherever the king is. A king and his government are inseparable. This is how we can know that the kingdom of heaven is on earth. The kingdom is here because the earth is here, Jesus said. If two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my father in heaven. If two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Matthew 18 and 19 through 20. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28 and 18 through 20. The kingdom of heaven is here because the king of heaven is here in the hearts and lives of his citizens who populate his colony here. Number 10, a king's presence is the presence of his authority. When a king shows up, his full authority is present. His authority does not reside in a place or in a document. 
It resides in him personally. This is why citizens of God's kingdom colony on earth can act with kingly authority because the king is present. His authority is present also. It was this present authority that Jesus had in mind when he said, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18 and 18. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the son may bring glory to the father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. John 14 and 13 through 14. Kingdom citizens may always exercise kingly authority because the king is always present with them. Number 11. A king's wealth is measured by his property. The larger and richer in resources a king is, the wealthier the king because the king owns everything in his kingdom. Dictators become wealthy by stealing from the people. Democratically elected leaders may or may not be personally wealthy, but they definitely do not own their country. This is one of the major distinctions between a king and other government leaders. Kings own everything in their domain by right of birth and kingship. As a matter of fact, property is so tied up with a king's identity that without it, a king is not a king. We will discuss this more thoroughly in chapter 6. Why is wealth so important in a kingdom? So the king can take care of his citizens. A righteous and benevolent king does not mass wealth for himself, but for the welfare of his citizens. This is why it is only in a kingdom where we truly find common wealth. That is, the wealth is common to all the people. No kingdom is greater or richer than the kingdom of heaven because it encompasses all that exists. And no king is wealthier than the king of heaven because he owns everything everywhere in both the natural and supernatural realms. Consequently, no citizen of any government are more prosperous or have greater welfare than do citizens of the kingdom of heaven because all the infinite wealth of the kingdom is their common wealth. Number 12. A king's prosperity is measured by the statue of his citizens. If the citizens are poor, the king is seen as a poor king. If the citizens are prosperous, however, the king is seen as a wealthy king. Wealthy citizens make a king proud. That is why it is important for a king to make sure his people prosper. Jesus never preached prosperity, why not? Because prosperity is a matter of kingdom business. Anyone who becomes a citizen of the kingdom of heaven automatically prospers because the king of a heaven is a wealthy king. The wealthiest of all. And he is also a righteous and benevolent king who is committed to the fullest and greatest welfare of his people. Number 13. A king's name is the essence of his authority. A king can delegate authority to anyone he pleases to act in his name or on his behalf. This is often done by issuing a king's letter, a royal edict signed by the king and bearing his official seal that authorizes the bearer to act on his authority. Anyone to whom the king's letter is presented must treat the bearer as if he were the king himself. Nehemiah, another exiled Jew who was a contemporary of Daniel, was cupbearer to the Parisian king, Artaxerxes. Hearing that Jerusalem had been destroyed, Nehemiah longed to go there and rebuild the city. When the king learned of Nehemiah's desire, he granted him permission to go. He also issued letters instructing the keeper of the king's forest to give Nehemiah all the material he required and for the governors of the various provinces to grant him safe passage. Nehemiah carried the king's name and therefore his authority. See Nehemiah chapters 1 through 2. Citizens of the kingdom of heaven have the same privileges. 
Jesus the king has issued king's letters to all his people, delegating his authority to them. That is why the New Testament says that kingdom citizens are to pray in the name of Jesus. It is why he promised to do anything that they ask in his name. There is nothing religious or mysterious about this. It is simply a kingdom principle at work. The king's name carries the same authority as the king himself and all who carry his name can operate in his authority. Number 14, a king's citizenry represents his glory. Any conscious king wants his citizens to be happy, prosperous, and content because their status and quality of life reflects on him. The greater their prosperity and well-being, the greater the glory and honor that rests on the king who provides for them so well. Citizens of God's kingdom are supposed to show what their king is like by the way they live, act, dress, walk, and talk. Kingdom citizens are to reflect the nature and character of their king, who is righteous, just, benevolent, compassionate, and full of glory. This is why there is no poverty in the kingdom of heaven, no economic crisis, and no shortages. As King David observed, the Lord upholds the righteous. I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Psalm 37, 17b and 25. The king of heaven takes care of his citizens. Appropriating the riches of the kingdom of heaven means first of all, understanding that the king owns everything and we own nothing. And second, that he can give whatever he wants to anyone he wants whenever he wants. This is the kingdom concept of lordship and is the subject of the next chapter. Kingdom principles. Principles. Number one, a kingdom is the sovereign rulership and governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his intent, and his purpose. Number two, in the fullness of time, Jesus came to earth and reestablished the kingdom because only a king can establish a kingdom. This act alone reveals that Jesus Christ is the king. Number three, Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world. He never said that it was not in this world. Number four. Inside each of us is a Latin kingdom consciousness striving for expression. Number five, we all seek power over things and over circumstances, and that is what the kingdom of heaven promises. Number six, a king is the central component of his kingdom. Number seven, a king is the ultimate and only source of authority in his kingdom. Number eight, the sovereignty of a king is inherent in his royal authority. And number nine, God's sovereignty is absolute. He is completely self-determining. Well, that concludes the full reading of chapter four. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, let's dive into a brief summary to reflect on the key concepts. In this chapter, Dr. Monroe explains the unique nature of kingship, especially how it differs from democratic or dictatorial systems. One point that really resonated with me is that a king's authority is absolute. Unlike presidents or prime ministers who rely on legislative bodies, a king's word is law. And once a king makes a decree, it cannot be changed. This concept is so important when we think about God as our king. When he speaks, his words are unchanging and his promises are everlasting. Another thing that stood out to me is that a king owns everything in his domain. 
While presidents and other elected leaders are citizens of their country, a king personally owns everything in his kingdom. As Psalm 24 and 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. This means that we as kingdom citizens belong to God. Everything we have and everything we are belongs to him. Isn't that a comforting thought? I also love how Dr. Monroe pointed out that a king's name is the essence of his authority. As kingdom citizens, when we pray in Jesus name, we are invoking the authority of the king himself. There's nothing mysterious or religious about this. It's simply a kingdom principle at work. Jerome Rowe, please, before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, All That and More Hair Salon, a brand that truly embraces the idea of wholeness, offering custom, natural-looking hair solutions. Whether you're looking for hair extensions or their signature non-surgical hair enhancement services for those experiencing hair loss due to alopecia or chemotherapy, their team is dedicated to helping you feel restored and confident. For our listeners, All That and More Hair Salon is offering an exclusive discount. Head over to their website at bit.ly backslash m backslash a t m hair. I'm going to repeat that. That is b i t dot l y backslash m backslash a t m h a i r and use the code whole journey at checkout to receive 15% off any of their custom hair services or products for a limited time only. This offer is specially created to support your journey of beauty and wholeness. Now let's get back to today's topic. And now for our scripture reference, Psalms 24 and 1 and Psalm 50, 10. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And Psalm 50, 10 reminds us, For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. These verses affirm God's ownership over everything in creation. As king, he not only rules with authority, but he also possesses all that is in his kingdom, including us. Understanding this helps us submit to his sovereignty with humility and gratitude. And now let's talk about how we can practically apply these kingdom concepts to our daily lives. One of our listener, James, wrote in with a question. How do I apply this concept of kingship and God's absolute authority in my daily life? James, thank you for your question. One way to apply this practically is by surrendering your plans to God daily. This week, try waking up each morning and saying, Lord, today I acknowledge that you are king and I submit my plans to you. Guide my decisions, my interactions, and my thoughts. Help me walk in alignment with your decree. You can even set reminders throughout the day to check in and realign your focus on his kingdom. Just like earthly kings oversee their kingdoms, God is overseeing every area of your life. Start each day by inviting him to take his rightful place as king over your work, relationships, and decisions. And now let's turn to the day four questions from the Kingdom Principles Study Guide. These questions are a great way to reflect on the concepts of governance, authority, and our role in God's kingdom. Question number one, 90% of all national and international problems facing our world today are the result either of government or religion. Have you seen this to be true in the world you observe? 
Take some time to think about current events. Can you trace the root of the problems back to issues in government or religion? Question number two. Have you ever met anyone who did not respond to order and government at all? If government and order are inherent in the human spirit, why do you think we sometimes rebel against it? Reflect on why humans naturally seek order yet often push back against it. How does this tension manifest in our personal lives and societies? Question number three, how does the need for social order manifest itself in your life? Do you find your relationships are comfortably managed or more chaotic? Think about the relationships in your life. Are they characterized by order and peace or do you find that chaos often creeps in? And now for our poll questions. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's topic. What aspect of God's kingship resonates with you most? Here are the options. Number one, God's ownership over everything. Number two, the unchanging authority of God's word. Number three, the power in Jesus name, number four, God's sovereignty as king, or number five, God's absolute authority. You can answer the poll on any of the platforms, including TikTok, um, YouTube, any of the podcasts, Instagram, and feel free to share your reflection in the comments. I love hearing how these concepts are impacting your journey. And now for our meditation. Today's meditation comes from Romans 8, 19 through 21, which talks about creation waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Take time to contemplate how God's kingdom governance operates through you. Are you governing your life according to God's principles or Are you still trying to control things on your own terms? If today's episode resonated with you, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review on your podcast platform. Your support helps us reach more people who are seeking to live out their kingdom identity. And remember to share this episode with someone who would benefit from it. Join our community at bit.ly backslash m backslash get married whole. That is B-I-T dot L-Y backslash M backslash G-E-T-M-A-R-R-I-E-D-W-H-O-L-E. And follow us on social media, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter using the handle Use that little at sign, get married whole, all one word. For more discussions and reflections, we love to hear how you're embracing your role in God's kingdom. And if you're interested in sponsoring or partnering with us, we love to discuss meaningful ways we can collaborate. Whether it's advertising your brand or working together on a special project, visit our website for more information. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing the depth of your kingship and authority to us today. Help us live out these kingdom principles in every area of our lives. Guide us as we submit to your sovereignty and embrace our role as kingdom citizens. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I hope you have been transformed and have grown. I'll see you in the next chapter, chapter five, kingdom concept number two, understanding the kingdom concept of Lord. Again, I'm your host, Queen Rakelia, and remember, you are special, unique, and wonderfully made, and above all, you are the apple of God's eye. He's got you on his mind. There is great love for you here, and we are complete.
You have been listening to Get Married Whole Podcast at Get Married Whole.